Listening Section Directions This test measures your ability to understand conversations and lectures in English. The listening section is divided into two separate timed parts. You will hear each conversation or lecture only one time. After each conversation or lecture, you will answer some question on it. The questions typically ask about the main idea and supporting details. Some questions ask about a speaker's purpose or attitude. Answer the questions based on what is stated or implied by the speakers. You may take notes while you listen. You may use your notes to help you answer the questions. Notes will not be scored. In some questions, you will see this icon. This means that you will hear, but not see. Part of the question. Some of the questions have special directions. These directions appear in a gray box on the screen. Most questions are worth one point. If question is worth more than one point, it will have special directions that indicate how many points you can receive. You must answer each question. After you answer, click on Next, then click on OK to confirm your answer and go on to the next question. After you click on OK, you cannot return to previous questions. In an actual test or during this practice test, a clock at the top of the screen will show you how much time is remaining. The clock will not count down while you are listening. The clock will count down only while you are answering questions. Click on Continue at any time to dismiss these directions. Listen to a conversation between a student and an employee in the student activities office. Hi there. I heard this is where I can get information about school trips. Yes, you're in the right place. How can I assist you today? Well, I'm interested in finding out about any upcoming ski trips. Ah, perfect timing. We just scheduled a ski trip for next month. We haven't started advertising it yet, so you'll be among the first to sign up. That's great. Actually, I have a question about a ski trip that took place around seven years ago. My brother went on it, and he always talks about the amazing hotel they stayed at. It was like a ski lodge or something. Oh, I see. Do you happen to remember which hotel it was? Unfortunately, my brother can't recall the name. Our family is considering planning a ski vacation during winter break, and we'd love to go to the same place. But it's a bit of a challenge without knowing the name. I understand. I wasn't working here at the time, and we don't have records for older trips. However, you might want to check with the newspaper office. They often advertise or write articles about school trips when they occur. That's a good idea. Thanks for the suggestion. By the way, did you mention that there's a ski trip planned this year? Could it be the same hotel? It's unlikely. This time we'll be heading to the new mountain lodge at Snowy Mountain. It was constructed just last year. I see. Well, I'm not much of a skier myself. But the place my brother went to had other activities like a fireplace, an ice skating rink, and a game room. Do you know if the new lodge offers those amenities too? Absolutely. Mountain Lodge has all that and more. They have live music, dancing, and a fantastic dining room. The food has received excellent reviews. That sounds tempting. It might be a nice break from our cafeteria food for a couple of days. Indeed. The best part is that it's an all-inclusive package. Students pay a single price, and everything, including skiing, ice skating, food, equipment, and lessons, is included. That's fantastic. Do you have any brochures or materials I can look at for more details? I'm afraid we don't have them yet. We just finalized the trip yesterday. However, our trip planning committee is always open to new members. They're meeting tomorrow night to discuss the trip's specifics. You should consider joining. Your input on scheduling activities that would appeal to non-skiers could be valuable. That's an interesting suggestion. If I have the time, I might just do that. Excellent. If enough students sign up, we may... What is the conversation mainly about?
Why does the man propose the student check with the newspaper office? How does he convince the student to go upcoming school ski trip? Why does the man believe the student can help the trip planning committee? Why does the student say this? My brother went on it, and he always talks about the amazing hotel they stayed at. Listen to part of a lecture in an evolutionary biology class. Today, we're going to delve into an interesting topic in evolutionary biology. We'll be discussing Cope's rule, a principle proposed by Edward Cope in the 19th century. Cope observed a pattern of increasing sizes within species based on his examination of fossils. Now, let's explore this concept further. Cope's rule suggests that evolution is inclined towards larger sized creatures and this trend is evident in many fossil lineages. Fossil lineages are chronological charts that track the fossils of a specific species over time. By comparing fossils of different ages, Cope noticed a tendency towards larger sizes. What advantages do you think larger size might offer within a species? Well, being larger can serve as a deterrent to predators, offering better protection. It may also make individuals more fuel efficient, requiring less food per pound to sustain themselves. Additionally, larger females might produce more eggs, increasing their chances of passing on their genes. I've highlighted some of the advantages associated with larger size, including predator deterrence, fuel efficiency, and enhanced reproductive success. These factors contribute to the potential evolutionary advantage of larger size. However, in the 1970s and 80s, Stephen Jay Gould challenged Cope's rule and put forward an alternative theory. Gould believed that evolution was a more random process than previously thought. He argued against the notion that evolution has a predetermined direction. What was Stephen Jay Gould's primary criticism of Cope's rule? Gould believed that theories like Cope's rule were influenced by the scientists' psychology and preconceived notions rather than being based on solid scientific evidence. He argued that the fossil record is incomplete and that comparing sizes of fossils from different time periods could be misleading. Gould indeed challenged Cope's rule on the grounds that it might have been influenced by cognitive biases and incomplete fossil records. He argued that Cope's comparisons of sizes across different time periods might not be representative or accurate. Furthermore, Gould proposed an intriguing alternative. He suggested that after a natural disaster, when a significant number of individuals in a species are wiped out, the smaller individuals have a higher likelihood of survival. 
This can lead to a misleading perception of evolution as being directed towards larger sizes, while in reality, it is a random process. Now, let's explore some additional aspects related to Cope's rule. It's important to consider other challenges to this principle. For example, why do we still observe a wide variety of small animals on Earth? Well, one reason lies in the physical limitations imposed by the laws of physics. An insect, for instance, cannot grow to the size of an elephant due to the constraints of its exoskeleton. In conclusion, Cope's What is the lecture mainly about? What idea does Cope's rule try to support? Why does the professor mention the benefits of larger animals? What does Gould say often happens after natural disasters? Why does the professor say insects can't be elephant-sized? Why does the professor say this? This can lead to a misleading perception of evolution as being directed towards larger sizes, while in reality, it is a random process. Listen to part of a lecture in a photography class. Good morning, class. Today, I want to delve into the fascinating world of high dynamic range, HDR photography. HDR photography is a technique that allows photographers to capture a greater level of detail in their images across the entire range of light. Yes, Alex? Professor, I was wondering, how do painters showcase details in different lighting conditions? It seems like a challenging task. That's an excellent question, Alex. Painters indeed face a significant challenge when it comes to capturing the full range of light. 
Our eyes possess a remarkable ability called perceptual dynamic range, which refers to the number of distinct levels of light our eyes can perceive. In our everyday world, this range can exceed 50,000 to 1. However, when artists attempt to recreate this range with paint and canvas, they are limited to a range of about 300 to 1. Excuse me, Professor. I'm curious about photography. Does it have a greater dynamic range compared to paintings? Great question, David. Traditional photography, surprisingly, doesn't possess a significantly greater dynamic range than paintings due to the limitations of film and paper. However, photographers have developed techniques to make details stand out, similar to painters. Take Ansel Adams, for instance. In 1941, he introduced the zone system, which divided the entire range of light intensities into 10 equal zones. This system allowed photographers to measure tonal ranges consistently. It was widely adopted and used until the 1980s. Does the zone system work only for black and white film? No, Ross. Although Adams primarily used black and white, the zone system is applicable to color photography as well. Now, let's move on to HDR photography, which has revolutionized the way we capture and process images. HDR stands for High Dynamic Range. Professor, what exactly is High Dynamic Range Photography? Excellent question, Michael. HDR photography takes advantage of the capabilities of digital cameras and computer software to overcome the limitations of traditional equipment. Let's explore how it works. Please direct your attention to the screen. In front of you are three pictures of the same scene. The first picture, on the left, is underexposed, resulting in dark tones. While you can see details in the snow and clouds, the darker areas lack sufficient light. The second picture represents a medium exposure, capturing the middle range of tones. Finally, the third picture is overexposed, allowing for some details in the shadows, but washing out the snow and the sky. Now, what if we combine these photos using HDR software? By blending details from all the images, we can create a final picture that showcases a greater level of detail across the entire dynamic range. It's amazing how technology can enhance our ability to capture stunning photographs. Absolutely, David. HDR photography has opened up new possibilities for photographers, allowing them to create visually striking and detailed images that were previously challenging to achieve. Just imagine all the photographs that could have been preserved and displayed rather than ending up in the trash can. In conclusion, whether it's painters using contrasting colors and lines to create the illusion of a wider dynamic range, or photographers utilizing HDR techniques, artists throughout history have strived to capture and convey the richness and complexity of light. As technology continues to advance, we can only imagine the future innovation. What is the lecture mainly about? What methods do painters use to enhance dynamic range? Why does the professor mention Ansel Adams? What does the professor suggest about traditional color photography?
Why take multiple photos in HDR photography? What does the professor mean when he says this? Just imagine all the photographs that could have been preserved and displayed rather than ending up in the trash can. Listen to a conversation between a student and an academic advisor. Hi, Professor. I hope you have a moment to talk. Of course, Jenny. What can I assist you with today? Well, I've been feeling a bit lost lately when it comes to choosing a major. I'm in my second year, and I still haven't found something that really speaks to me. It's not uncommon to feel uncertain at this stage, John. Many students go through a similar experience. What subjects have you been considering so far? I've explored a few options like psychology and business, but nothing has really sparked my interest. I want to find something that aligns with my passions and offers good career prospects. That's a great approach. Let's start by discussing your interests and strengths. What are some topics or activities that you genuinely enjoy or excel in? I've always loved working with numbers and solving problems. Math has been a strong suit for me, and I find it fascinating. Excellent. With your affinity for math, have you considered exploring fields like computer science, data analytics, or even actuarial science? These, these areas often require strong mathematical skills and offer promising career paths. I hadn't really thought about those options before. I guess I've been focusing too much on traditional majors. I'll definitely look into those fields. Thanks, Professor. You're welcome, John. Remember, it's important to think outside the box and consider non-traditional paths as well. Now let's talk about internships and extracurricular activities. Have you participated in any that might provide insights into different career possibilities? I've been involved in the campus newspaper and I really enjoy writing and editing. Journalism has crossed my mind as a potential career. That's fantastic. Journalism can be a rewarding field that combines your passion for writing with your interests in current events. You could also consider exploring related areas like public relations, marketing, or content creation. I hadn't thought about those connections. It's great to see how my interests can open up various career paths. Absolutely, John. Remember that your undergraduate degree doesn't necessarily define your entire career. It's a foundation that can lead you in many directions. Keep exploring and gathering experiences to help shape your path. Thank you so much, Professor. I feel more optimistic now about finding the right major and career path. I'll start researching the options we discussed and look into internships as well. That's the spirit, John. I'm glad I could help. Remember, I'm here to support you throughout this process. What are the speakers mainly discussing? What does the professor suggest about humanities majors?
Why does the professor discuss technical writing? What does the professor think about students going straight to grad school? What does the professor suggest the student do now? Listen to part of a lecture in an astronomy class. All right, class, today we're going to delve into a truly captivating natural phenomenon, auroras, also known as the northern lights and southern lights. These dazzling displays of light in the sky have captivated humanity for centuries, and today, we'll explore the science behind them. Has anyone here ever witnessed an aurora firsthand? Perhaps during a trip to a high latitude region? Well, I saw the Aurora Borealis when I was visiting Iceland a few years ago. It was breathtaking. I was in a small town near Jokulsarlan Glacier Lagoon. The sky lit up with these vibrant green curtains of light, and it moved and danced across the night sky. That's exactly how auroras often appear, as vibrant curtains or drapes of light. The most common color is green, but auroras can also exhibit reds, purples, and yellows. Now, these displays tend to occur in the high-latitude regions, near the Arctic and Antarctic circles. Um, are they caused by stars? Like, the light from distant stars somehow concentrates in the polar regions? Stars are definitely massive sources of light, but auroras are a different phenomenon altogether. Let's delve a bit deeper. The key player here is the sun. The sun's surface is constantly in a state of flux, with eruptions and solar flares sending out streams of charged particles, a hot, electrically charged wind called solar wind, in all directions. So, the solar wind is what creates auroras? But if the wind blows out in all directions, shouldn't auroras be visible everywhere on Earth? Here's where Earth's magnetic field comes into play. Imagine Earth as a giant bar magnet with invisible magnetic lines extending from the north and south poles. These lines form a protective shield around Earth, deflecting most of the solar wind particles. However, some energetic particles get channeled by the magnetic field towards the poles, where they collide with the upper atmosphere. How do these collisions create the... These excited molecules then release the extra energy as light, and when a large number of molecules are involved, we perceive this as the mesmerizing auroral displays. So, to recap, auroras are a result of energetic particles from the solar wind interacting with Earth's magnetic field and upper atmosphere. The colors we see depend on the specific gas molecules that are struck by the particles. Nitrogen generally produces blue and purple hues, while oxygen is responsible for the greens, reds, and yellows. The strength and direction of the solar wind, along with Earth's magnetic field's configuration, all influence the intensity, color, and shape of the auroras. What is the lecture mainly about?
What does the professor mention about Aurora appearances? The professor explains the sequence of aurora formation. Dragon match the steps to summarize the process. How does the professor say Earth's magnetic field shields organisms? What does the professor suggest about auroras and weather? Listen again to part of the lecture. Then answer the question. Um, are they caused by stars? Like, the light from distant stars somehow concentrates in the polar regions? What does the professor mean when he says this? Um, are they caused by stars? 